Good morning, church. It's good to see you all again. Thank you. So, um, it's raining outside. It was raining outside, but it's warm in here. So I'm good to. See, it's glad. I'm glad that everybody's here. It's good to see everyone. And you know, we have a, a lot of things going on in the world. Aren't there? We do. We have a lot of things. We have, and each of us are going through individual things, right? And sometimes it makes us feel barren and, and bare and, and broken, right? You notice I don't have any shoes on this morning. And I have my t-shirt on inside out this morning. Because sometimes that's how we feel. We feel upside down, inside out, discombobulated, right? We all have situations that um, we just don't feel together. You know, even sometimes as we're sitting in the house of the Lord, we still sometimes feel that way, right? So we're going to learn today about how to dress for success. Amen. Amen. And you all are going to help me dress for success. And I've asked Aki to help me to speed up the process this morning. So come on down. So sit there and share with you in a minute. So we're going to learn how to dress for success. And unfortunately, oftentimes, many of us, we drag the armor of God behind us. God has taught us how to dress for success by teaching us the armor of God. But we drag it behind us, just like I'm dragging this suitcase, and we don't put it on. And then we wonder why our day is not going how we would like to. So we're going to learn how to do that this morning. But before we do that, I'm I want to share a story with you. Does everybody know the story of David and Goliath? Yeah. Children, do you know the story of David and Goliath? It's amazing. Now I can see. All right. So if you turn with me to 1 Samuel 17, I'm going to do a comparison of the armor of God versus not wearing the armor of God. But before I do that, I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit to be here with us so that he can give us some clarity and just open up our minds. So whatever message you need to receive this morning, you can receive it. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for using me, this broken vessel, that you're using me this morning. So I thank you, Father. Now I ask that you baptize my mind and the mind of your sons and daughters here this morning by the power of your Holy Spirit so that whatever message we need to receive, we can receive it, Lord. Open up our minds. Whatever problems are going on, whether it's health, whether it's finances, whether it's relationship, Father, I ask that you will help us to put it aside to receive the message this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, the story goes that the children of Israel and the Philistines were in a valley, and it was called the Valley of Elah. And on one side was the Philistines, on the other side was, were the Israelites. But on the side of the Philistines, they had this huge, tall man called Goliath. I mean, perfect name, right? He was about 11 feet tall, and he had a booming voice, 
And if you turn with me to 1 Samuel 17, verse 4, it tells you a little more about him. It said he was six cubits, which is um, about 11, over 11 feet. It says in verse 5 that he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, which is basically a coat of armor, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. That's 126 pounds. Wow. That's a lot, right? Imagine having to carry that. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels and a shielded, uh, a shield bearer went before him and his spear therefore was 15 pounds. Wow, that's pretty heavy to be walking around with, 15 pounds. So here this man is standing and he's just booming threats to the Israelites, telling them, listen, send someone to come fight me, right? I'm going to kill him. I'm going to throw him to the birds. And guess what? It says in verse 24 that the men were dreadfully afraid. They were dreadfully afraid. Afraid. Have you ever been in a situation where you were dreadfully afraid? Yeah, I have. Anybody else? Right. They were dread. Now, we're talking about the children of Israel, the one who God had chosen, the one who God had parted the Red Seas and had done all these amazing things for those children. The one where God had done miracles and he had spoken to them through Moses and he had done, protected them and, and fed them and healed them. Those children, kind of like us, right? You know, God does amazing miracles. We pray and he, he does something and we're praising him and then something else shows up that might be similar or different and then we're dreadfully afraid. We forget what he had done before. And so here they are, dreadfully afraid. And David's father tell, told David, listen, I want you to go ahead and check on your brothers because, you know, word had spread and they knew what was going on. And basically, Philistines on this side, Israelites on this side, valley in between, and nobody is moving because they're dreadfully afraid. Right? They're not moving. They're focused on this giant. They're focused on his booming voice. They're focused on the fact that there is no way that we are going to be able to fight against this man. And you know what? They were right. However, they forgot that they are children of the Lord Most High and that God is our, our protector and God will fight for us. They forgot all about that. So David took some supplies and left it with the supply person and he, as he was going around, he was hearing Goliath with this booming voice throwing out all these threats. And so he started to inquire about this person in verses 25 through 27. He, he went to people and asked, well, what? who is this person? And oh, oh, what is he saying? He called him an uncircumcised Philistine. What is he talking about? And so he go, started to inquire. He went to his brother in verse 28, Eliab, his eldest brother, and he's like, you know, what's going on? And his brother's like, you know what? He says, I know your pride and your insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. He was calling him names. But you know what? David was like, what are you talking about? And he just turned his back and kept inquiring to find out what is going on. And finally, people were telling him that, well, basically what's going on is we need someone to fight him, and King Saul is going to give a reward. So he went to King Saul, 
And in verse 33, he tells King Saul, Saul, excuse me, of what's going on. And Saul tells him, you're not able to fight. Because listen, Saul is looking at this little young man, right? No armor. And you said you're going to fight? <laughs> Absolutely not. How many times have we been in situation where it looks impossible and someone tells you, you know, it's not possible to do that. It's just not. And they will give you the facts. They will give you the statistics. They will run it down and tell you to convince you that it's not possible. And unfortunately, sometimes we believe them. Why? Because we forget that we have an invisible armor. We forget that we are children of the most high God. But see, David did not forget. So in verse 34 and 35, David states his case. He lets him know who he serves. Right? Turn with me there. 1 Samuel 17, verse 34 and 35. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I struck it by its beard and struck and killed it. And then he went on to tell him that he did this with the living God, the Lord Almighty. See, whenever you have a situation when you're dreadful, dreadfully afraid, whenever you're in a situation where you, you run down the list, because sometimes we don't need someone else to run down the statistics, we could do it for ourselves, right? And we say, wow, this, this is an impossible situation, so we want to run. Let that be your trigger that, mm, no, wait a minute, I need to put on my armor, right? I need to put on my armor. So in verse 38 to 39, Saul gives David his armor, right? He gives David his armor, and it says, So Saul clothed David, verse 38, with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with this. <laughs> For I have not tested them. So David took them off. And then it goes on to say how he just took it off. He got his little staff. And then he got his sling. And he got how many stones? Five smooth stones. Not rocky, but five smooth stones. Right? To fight this giant of a mine. And then he went to go fight Goliath. And Goliath was a little upset because he's thinking, are you guys kidding me? You send this little puny man to fight me? What he didn't see was the invisible armor. He did not see David's invisible armor. So we're going to get dressed in this invisible armor this morning. Is that all right? So we're going to do it together. So turn with me to Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 18. We're going to read it out loud together. We have to remind ourselves that we have an armor. So on your device, in your Bible, Ephesians 6, verse 10 to 18. Let me know when you have it, and we're going to read it together. It doesn't matter what version you have. God loves a joyful noise. <laughs> Ready? All right. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Awesome. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. All right. Stand.
Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Keep. Keep reading. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. That is our armor. Amen. Praise the Lord. We have an armor. We are protected. Every situation we're in, we have this armor. All we need to do is put it on every morning, every day, throughout the day. We don't have to worry about our Goliaths, but it takes us being intentional about it. We've got to remind ourselves about it. So let's start getting dressed this morning. Okay. All right, so the first is the belt of truth. Thank you. Give a hand to my assistant. <laughs> so we've got our belt of truth. And let's read that again together. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. With truth. So in the Bible days, in the ancient days, the belt of truth, or the, they, they would put like a belt, and the belt was really wide, I couldn't find one. I don't have one, so I have to get one. But the belts were really wide, and they would protect their kidneys and all the vital organs. You know where I'm going with this? God's truth is our protection. God's truth is the light, right? The Bible says that you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free, right? Some versions say set, King James Version says make you free, right? It's the truth that we know. It says you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. If you don't know the truth, it can't set you free. That's basically what it's saying. So we need to know the truth in God's word. And the only truth that does not change in this earth from beginning of time and beyond is the word of God, God's truth. His truth illuminates all those things in our life that don't matter. His truth illuminates all those things in our life that we're afraid of that we really don't need to be afraid of. His truth tells us who we should be as a wife or as a husband. His truth tells us who we should be as parents. His truth tells us how we should conduct our businesses. His truth tells us how we should be as employees or managers. His truth tells us anything, any situation, and his truth will tell you how to conduct yourself. We don't have to worry. We don't have to ponder. It's in there somewhere. Who's that, Ragu? It's in there, right? It's in there. So the truth protects us. It's there to protect us. It's not there to, um, to put us in a cage and to make us feel like we have boring, drab, Christian lies, that's not what it is for. It's so that we can have joyful lives, lives of joy and peace, right? Life of prosperity and power, amen? That is what God's truth is for. And see, because Satan knows that, he will send his waves of deception. He is really good at deceiving us. That's why he was banished to a snake. You know, he slithers into our lives. And it's so subtle sometimes we don't even realize it. 
until he's got us. But the truth protects us. The truth protects us. So we have to meditate on God's truth. We have to meditate on God's truth because God's truth is his life. All right, so let's keep getting dressed. All right, so what's next? Let's see, what's next? All right, so we've got the breastplate of righteousness. Let's read this together. Stand therefore, having put on the blessed breastplate of righteousness. This is my breastplate of righteousness. So we're getting, we're getting dressed. So imagine you're getting dressed for work or wherever you're going, right? So you put on your jacket or your shirt, and it reminds you that we are covered by the blood of Jesus. It reminds us that he is our righteousness. We are, the Bible says, we are the righteousness of God on our own. Through Christ, through Christ Jesus, we are the righteousness of God. So in the Bible days, the breastplate would cover the heart and the lungs to protect the soldier, right? And so the righteousness of God protects us. It protects our heart, the most important part, because that's what we worship God with, right? It protects our heart. And our hearts are susceptible to the wickedness of the world. We listen to things on the news. We listen to other people and we open our hearts and then we get our hearts hurt, we get our hearts broken, we get our hearts turned. But our protection is Christ's righteousness. So you know, many mornings I'll look in the mirror and I will say, I am the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. We have to remind ourselves, because if we don't remind ourselves who we are, anybody can come and tell us anything, and we will believe it. We will think that we're not powerful. We will think that we're not fearfully and wonderfully made. But we are the righteousness of God through Christ. So I want everyone to say it with me. I am the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. I didn't believe you, so you need to say it again. I am the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. And you know what? Maybe you don't believe it, but we say these things by faith. By faith. And eventually what happens when you keep saying things like that to yourself, over time, it takes about 21 or more days, you will start to believe it. And when you start to believe things like that, you're going to start acting differently. You're going to start re responding to things differently. The reason why some of us act the way we act is because some of us don't believe God loves us. We know he loves us, but we don't believe he loves us. And there's a difference. So the breastplate, it protects. We cannot become righteous with our own works. It's through Christ. We need him. We need Christ to protect us. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, for he made him, that's Christ, who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We need Jesus Christ. We need our Lord and Savior. All right, so let's continue getting dressed. So, um, I keep forgetting, I'm the controller here today. So the next thing, ooh, the gospel of peace. So the gospel of peace was something that protected the soldiers, right? Because what the enemy would do in ancient times is they would throw these little spikes all on the ground, right? So that when they came up, it would make them imbalanced and fall over so that they didn't have a sure footing. So what they would do in ancient times is you see that um, the bottom of that sandal, 
they would put like these little spikes and things on the bottom. So it actually helped to balance them above those spikes that were put on the ground. You know, the gospel of Christ, it balances our lives. It gives us an opportunity to share with someone why we're full of joy in the midst of our trials. To share with someone why we have peace. Why we're going through the same thing they're going through, but yet we still have peace, we still have joy. It's because of who? It gives us an opportunity to let someone know that they can be saved, that there is someone that loves them so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to save them from their sins. It gives us that opportunity. So I'm going to put on my shoes. I'm glad you have a sense of humor. Okay. All right, so I've got my shoes. I've got my shoes, the gospel of peace. So now I can really go around and tell people about who God is. Amen? Because that's what we're supposed to be doing. And let me tell you, God will always give us opportunities. Now you might think that, well, I don't go around a lot. I don't know a lot of people. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you an opportunity. Guess what? He will give you one. At the grocery store, in the restaurant, as you're walking in the park, he will give you an opportunity. Um, one day, my mother and I were walking in the park, and I don't know why this young lady asked my mother and I, but for some, because there was a lot of people that had passed her by, right? We were going in the opposite direction. Some reason she stopped my mother and I, and she said, um, "Could I ask you a question?" And we're like, "Yeah." She said, "Do you pray?" And we're like, "Yeah." And she said, um, um, I, "I really need prayer. My sister and I do because we lost both of our parents. Um, it was last September." And she said, "And I just could not get over it. It's really breaking my heart." And so I asked, "Could we pray with you right now?" And she said. Oh, yes. And so we prayed with her, and she went her way. But that was an opportunity, right? It was an opportunity. And I could have said, okay, yeah, we'll pray and keep going, right? Um, but my mother was like, let's pray with her. And so we prayed with her. There's opportunities all around us, all around us. All you need to do is ask. And you might think, well, I'm not an evangelist. I don't have an evangelistic spirit. I don't have an evangelistic spirit either. I have a teacher's spirit, but I love the Lord, and God is going to give me opportunities to use my gift. He's given each of us gifts. So it might not be the same way that he, um, I do it, right? Or Manette does it, but he's going to use your gifts. Maybe you're good at baking, so you can bake. Uh, a pie for the new neighbor that uh, moved into your neighborhood. There's so many different ways. God is creative and he's unique. And so are you because we're made in his image. So Satan scatters traps in our lives all the time. He, he scatters the traps throughout the day and then we have a choice. We can fall into the traps or we can put on our armor, right? We can put on our armor, be balanced, and just walk over those traps. Everybody here has that opportunity. I don't care how young you are. I don't care how old you think you are. Everybody here has an opportunity because you are on this side. You're breathing. That means God can and wants to use each and every one. And he will use you in a different way that he uses me. For, uh, 2 Timothy 4 verse 2 says, Preach the word and be ready in season and out of season. Be ready. So every morning... I am the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you are with me right now. Prepare intentionally before you go out. Look in that mirror. Speak to yourself. Declare the word. 
be ready with the gospel of peace. Be ready with the gospel of peace. So, okay, so what's the next thing in the armor? The helmet? Somebody said the helmet? What is it? Ah, shield of faith. Let's read that together. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Amen. Hallelujah. Here's my shield of faith. <laughs> Gentlemen, you could use a briefcase or something like that. All right. This is my shield of faith. Listen, the enemy sends darts of doubt. He sends darts of doubt in our lives. And let me tell you, we have a choice every day. There are 80,000 plus thoughts that go through your mind in a 24-hour period. We're aware of about 4,000 of them. We have the power of self-control to choose our thoughts. The Bible says, take captive. That's an action word. Let me see you all put your hands up and grab down, we have the ability to take captive our thoughts and make them obedient to Christ. So every time a thought floats by in your mind, you have a choice. You can just let it flow by. Or you can choose to take it captive and line it up with what the Word says. But what most of us do with most of our thoughts, what we do, is we take that thought. So you might open your eyes and think, oh, I'm so tired, I don't wanna to go to work, or I don't wanna get out of bed, I just wanna stay here, because you could have a million and one reasons why. So that thought floats by, and you say, you know what, I really am tired, and I really don't wanna get out of bed. And so you start meditating on that thought. And then you start feeling even more tired. And then you might start feeling frustrated. And then it goes on and on. Or you could say, you know what? I can do all things through who? Christ who strengthens me. We have the ability to choose our thoughts. We do not. Now, years ago, they believed that you cannot change what you think. But we've, with scientific studies, and you can go online and um, uh, do some research with Dr. Caroline Leaf. She's a Christian neuroscientist. She's done a lot of study about the mind and the brain. And what I love about her is she aligns it with the word of God. We do have the ability to change our thinking over time, right? But what I have learned now that I'm more intentional about my thoughts, the thoughts that I used to think, they might float by, but where it might be hundreds of times a minute, now it might be only 40 times or 30 times or 20 times a minute. So it's getting less and less because I'm being intentional about the thoughts that I choose. So when the enemy sends those doubts, you put up your shield of faith, right? Put up your shield of faith and by faith, you declare the word of God. By faith, you pray. By faith, you be intentional about the thoughts. A lot of what we have to do has to be by faith. And so you put up that shield of faith. It's not about your feelings because you might not feel energized. You might not feel happy. You might not feel joyful. You might not feel at peace. You might not feel good. But you're saying the word of God by faith. That's how it works, by faith. Okay? It reminds me of the story of, um, of Peter. Do you know that when the Satan sends most of his darts, especially when God is not visible in your situation, 
and especially when God is not immediate. Think about it. When you pray about something and you've been waiting for a day or a week or a month or a year, he starts to send those doubts. And then we start to believe them. And that's when we sink, right? Or when God is not visible in our situation at first, he sends those darts of doubts. And it makes me think about Peter on the water. He got out the boat by faith. And we, we start out by faith, right, in our situations. He got out of the boat by faith. And then what happened? And he was looking at Jesus. He was looking at Jesus, but then he looked down and he saw the waves. And if he's anything like me, analytical, and he started to speak facts to himself. Wait a minute, those waves look a little angry. And I'm doing what? In the, oh, in the lake? Oh my goodness. I'm going to sink. I can imagine he said something like that. And then you start focusing on those thoughts of doubt, and guess what happens? He sank. But thank you that Jesus is not like us. Because some of us would probably be like, yeah, go ahead and sink. You were doing good for a while there. But Jesus grabbed his hand and pulled him out. Even when Paul was sinking, Jesus still saved him. But there's something that Jesus said to um, Peter that was interesting. And he said, O oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? So I want you to stand because we're going to do some declarations. I'm going to do some declarations. So stand up. Let's practice. Let's practice saying um, things based on the word by faith, right? You might not feel like it, right? But with our relationship with Christ, it's not how you feel, but it's by faith. I am a child of the Most High God. And say it like you mean it. I am a natural boy and warrior. Made in the image of God. I have been recruited at this very moment for kingdom service. I am a weapon, beautiful but deadly, to the enemy. I am made in the image of God. Say it like you believe it. I am made in the image of God. Amen. I am fully equipped. To defeat the enemy. I am an extension of God's love. God's grace. God's forgiveness. God's anointing. And creativity. I am covered by Christ's blood. And I go where God guides me. Say amen and have a seat. <laughs> Amen. And any, I brought a few copies, so if anybody wants a copy, I can give it to you at the end. I'll give them to Aki to pass out. All right, so let's keep getting dressed. Got two, three more, real quick. Helmet of salvation. Helmet of salvation. And take the helmet of salvation. Here's my helmet. My helmet of salvation. So salvation means being saved. It means being delivered, right? And so the helmet of salvation, it protects your head. So it protects our thoughts, right? It protects our thoughts. So when here's, here's a few ways to, to keep your helmet tight. One is to do what Romans 12 verse 2 said. Renew your mind. Renew your mind with the word of God. So do what I do in the morning. Stand in front of the mirror. Write them down and, and just say certain scriptures related to your situation. Right? I am the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am 
fearfully and wonderfully made. And say to yourself every morning, every night, and I'm telling you within 30 days, you're going to see a difference of who you are being, right? And how you handle your situation. A second way to keep your helmet tight is to do 2 Corinthians 4 and 5, take captive your thoughts and make them obedient to, to Christ. So yes, you're going to have thoughts that don't line up. Yes, you are going to have doubts, but it's okay. Grab that thought if you feel like, you know what, I cannot do this. This is impossible. Say, wait a minute. The Bible tells me I can do all things through Christ. That's how you do it. Change what you're saying. In other words, change the channel. And the third way is to reject doubt. To do what? Reject doubt. Matthew 21, verse 21, and Mark 11, verse 12. 23, um, Jesus talked about how to reject that. So Matthew 21, verse 21, read that later. All right, next thing. The sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit. The word of God. Now, the sword of the spirit is the only offensive weapon in the armor of God. All the others are defensive weapons. This is the offensive weapon. So, just as we did earlier, you take that word of God. Listen, Christ gave us an example, right? In Matthew 4, when the Holy Spirit led him to the wilderness and Christ um, and Satan attacked Christ, did Christ grumble back at him? Did Christ talk back to him with his own words? What did he do? It is written. He used the word of God because God's word does not come back to us void, right? Christ used the word of God. And in Hebrews 4.12, it tells us that the word of God is powerful, right? It's like a double-edged sword. You have a sword, it's invisible to the enemy, but it's powerful. And finally, the last part of the armor is the power of prayer. Let's read that together. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. For all the saints. Smart soldiers, because we are all soldiers in God's army, yes? We're all soldiers in God's army. That's why we have our armor. Smart soldiers keep an open communication with their commander. Smart soldiers have an open communication, line of communication with their commander. We serve a God who doesn't go on vacation. He does not take the weekends off. He does not sleep at night. He's up all night. 24-7, we can call on him in prayer. Anytime I could be driving, I could be in the middle of a conference, I could be at work, wherever. I could be in the middle of a battle, a verbal battle with someone. Anytime we can call on God, call on God in prayer. First John 5 verse 14 says, now this is the confidence, the what? The confidence that we have. In him, that if we ask anything, or is it just some things, a few things, one or two things, anything, according to his will, he hears us. And Mark eleven twenty four, one of my favorites says, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Believe. When you pray, believe. When you pray, do what? Believe. Do what? Believe. Do what? 
Believe that you will receive it when you pray. When you pray, pray by faith, believing. Sometimes when we pray, we don't believe that he's going to do what we're praying for. Start believing. Start praying by faith. The impossible prayers, because he loves to do impossible things. Amen. Amen. So this morning, I just stopped by to get dressed with you. Amen. To put on the armor of God and to remind us that we have an armor and we don't have to drag it around. We can put it on and we can fight every Goliath in our life. Everything. All your impossible situations that you've decided that it's not possible and you've just yielded to that situation. Pull those situations back up and put on your armor and pray and declare the world and watch and see what God does. And give him time. Give him time to do his work. So who's going to start wearing their armor every morning? Amen? Wait, I see it on this side. What's up over here? What's, on, what's going on on this side? All right. Amen. Heavenly Father, you see the hands and you see our hearts. You know our situations. And so, Father, we ask that you remind, send your Holy Spirit to remind us every morning. We need reminders to put on your armor. To remind us during the day when we're in battle to put on our armor. To remind us, Lord, at night when we feel feeling overwhelmed from our situations of the day, that we need to put on our armor. Thank you for being a God that is always with us, that never leaves us, that never forsakes us. Thank you for being a God that likes impossible situations. Thank you for being a God that hears our prayers. Thank you for loving us so much that you sent Jesus Christ to die for us. We thank you, O oh God. Now help us to go and not forget what we learned. Help us to put on our gospel uh, um, shoes of the gospel on our feet so that we can tell someone else of your goodness. Give us those opportunities this week, I pray, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.